this is this is our our first uh, neurology presentation, right? Of of the uh, of this season. Yeah. That is correct. Yes. So um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that means, and uh, we'll go through. Uh, we wanted to do some, uh, you know, to run through some some clinical uh, clinical scenarios a little bit, um, sort of um, a little peek into uh, the way we think and the way we examine patients and that sort of thing. So, and I see Dr. Langer is is also. Uh, What's up, staff? Thanks for joining us. Just wanted to say hi. David. There's a medical student here that's thinking about going into neurology, so I was just showing him your talk. <laughs> awesome, great. Really good great. to see you. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for uh, for involving us, of course. So, um, so yeah. So um, you know, last year I gave a talk about um, uh, you know what is uh, you know neuroimmunology and sort of went through. A few of the diagnoses um, that we look at, I'd like to do a little bit, you know, something a little bit different um, this year, of course, because um, um, you have all of that stuff online. You can always access it um, if you want. But um, just as a review, I mean, what what we do as, a, a, you know, what somebody does as a neuroimmunologist um, is um, uh, really uh, specialized in disorders that uh, in, in immune disorders that affect the nervous system. So it's that um, uh, connection between the immune system and the nervous system that we are uh, learning more and more about um, every every day, really. Um, so um, a lot of that uh, has to do with multiple sclerosis, of course, but then there are some other uh, rare conditions like NMO, neuromyelitis optica, um, and then uh, autoimmune encephalitis. There are a whole list um, that I won't share with you uh, today, but, um, you know, as I mentioned last year and it keeps on keep, you know, the field keeps on changing that there um, are, you know, really uh, advancements every year in, in, in how we treat these conditions. Um, and just a little bit, because I know um, a lot of you are in the, you know, either thinking about medical school or in medical school, um, you're early on in your careers. And so um, there, you know, I'm sure you have a question of how does one actually get into this, uh, into this business. And so um, basically, um, neuroimmunology, it's four years of medical school, um, just like everybody else, and then four years of residency. So that's the neurology residency. That's a one year internal medicine um, internship. And then um, so you don't do the full three years of internal medicine, just do one year, um, what's called a preliminary year, and then three years of, of, of neurology. And then after that, most neurologists these days um, subspecialize in something and the, that's that fellowship tends to be a little bit shorter than your sort of average um, internal medicine fellowships um, so they're about one to two years depending on what you're doing um, whether there's whether it's purely clinical or whether there's research involved um, that sort of thing so long road as as with every uh, um, uh, you know medical specialty but um, but this is this is how um, I'd like to so I, I mentioned that um, you know last year we sort of talked about diagnoses and a um, uh, little bit about treatment and that sort of thing and I'd like to do things a little bit differently um, this year although we will we will discuss a little bit about um, you know how we diagnose how we treat things um, but I'd like to especially since um, this is one of the few sort of um, almost like bread and butter neurology um, talks that you're going to get. Um, uh, I think Dr. Saba is giving one next week, um, but um, I'd like to talk a little bit about cases that sort of highlight different things in the exam that we might find. Um, and, um, you know, again, just sort of a peek into what a neurologist looks for and, and, and that sort of thing, the different, different subtleties on exam. So um, this, for example, um, is a, is a 30 year old woman. Um, she comes to the clinic. Uh, she has no past medical history. She's previously healthy. She's high functioning. Um, and she presents with uh, right eye pain, blurred vision, and, and trouble seeing color um, over the over a few days. Um, and she initially sees an ophthalmologist um, uh, who you know, does, a, does a full exam, finds nothing wrong with the eyes themselves. Um, but sure enough, she has 20 over 100 vision in the right eye, um, 20, 20 in the left. Um, so um, so you know, this is a, a, a you know, a fairly common scenario, I would say, but 
something that we see uh, a lot, but um, you know, I, I always uh, ask sort of what, what, what do we do next? What should we do next uh, with, with this patient? I just, I just uh, skipped over to the next slide. So the, the answer to those, of people, the, those people who are not in medical school yet um, is, is do an exam, um, <laughs> is do a physical exam. Um, so let's see, hopefully this, uh, this, this video works for us. Um, so it's a short one, so I'm gonna replay it a couple of times. And then we'll go over what, what, this, what this shows. And one more. Okay, so um, this, uh, you know, I don't know if, I mean, you guys probably already noticed that there was an abnormality in, in pupillary response. Um, so the normal response, normal response of the pupils to light. Um, so um, normal when, when you have sort of, um, uh, hopefully you can see my, my cursor, can you? Um, Yes, no, I'm not, not sure. Um, let me see if I can put a pointer. Yep, there we go. Um, so what you can see here is that sort of normally, I mean, in sort of ambient light, okay, pupils are sort of mid-size. When you shine, when you shine light on the on the eyes, when you shine light on the pupils, there's a constriction, right? Um, the pupils become smaller. Um, and so normally doesn't matter which eye you're shining light in, there is a a consensual response, right? Both pupils get get smaller, um, no matter which eye uh, is you know is is being um, affected. And so, what we do see here, um, just minimize this for a second. Um, so, what we do see here again, this is this is a, an example of what what the patient had. Um, so, in so the lights were out. We'll take a look at the video again. Lights got turned off. And um, when we shine the light in the unaffected eye, again, remember she had left eye vision problems. So if we shine a, a light in the unaffected eye, both pupils constrict. Then if we turn the light over to the other eye, to the left eye, uh, there's a dilation, okay? Um, it's still not as, as much as it was in the dark, but there's a dilation. Um, then we go back to the unaffected eye, to the normal eye, and there's a constriction, right, which is the normal response. We go back to the uh, affected eye, and again, there's a dilation. So this is what we refer to as a relative afferent pupillary defect, okay, in the left eye. Um, so why do we call it afferent? Um, I think you probably all, you, you guys know those terms already, but um, afferent is sort of the sensory arm of things. Efferent is the uh, is, is the the motor, the effector, right? Uh, pathways. And so, if we look at what happens in the in the you know behind the eye um, in the brain, so light is shine, let's say, into this eye. Um, there is a, a, a sensory right sensory uh, signal through the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two. It goes backwards. Okay, and it synapses in the pretectal nuclei. Okay, and then it sends bilateral innervations to what's called to this other nucleus. You don't have to remember its name. Um, and then that sends signals to both third nerve, uh, uh, you know, thir the third nerves on, on both sides, um, which cause constriction uh, of both eyes. Okay, so there's a consensual response. Even if you're shining just light in one eye, there's a consensual response, right? So what do we see on imaging um, of, of this patient? So this patient came to us, you know, she clearly had what's called an afferent pupillary defect um, in the left eye. And what we do see here is, and, you know, I think you can probably all, all uh, see that, is that this one looks pretty normal but there's enhancement here. There's, there's, um, this is a contrast T1 uh, MRI. There's uh, abnormal signal here. There, it's lighting up too much. Um, and the same you see here 
on an, this is a coronal view. Um, and then this is a top down axial view. So you can see um, this signal is just too bright. Um, this is the optic nerve. So these are the globes. Um, and then behind the, behind the eye is the optic nerve. That's the, again, that's the cranial nerve that sends it's number two, it's the second cranial nerve and it sends signals uh, backwards um, from the eye, um, afferent signals, right? Sensory signals. And so that's what was, what was injured in this patient. This patient actually had inflammation um, of the optic nerve. Um, so this is what we refer to inflammation of the optic nerve as optic neuritis, right? Itis is just, is just refers to inflammation, right? Um, and that's a type of optic neuropathy. When we say neuropathy, that just refers to um, a problem with, with, with the optic nerve, right? Um, and there are a number of different causes. Some of them are non-inflammatory, but optic neuritis just refers to inflammation. It's characterized by optic nerve swelling, um, and we can see that on MRI with contrast enhancement and high T2 signal. Um, and it can be non-infectious um, or infectious. Non-infectious tends to be much, much, much more common. Um, and when we do, when somebody does have optic neuritis, about 50% of the time it's associated with MS. Um, and about 50% of the time it's sort of, it happens on its own or rarely with other, rarely in other conditions. And so the flip side of that is that if somebody has MS, um, about 20% of the time their, their first symptom would be optic neuritis. So it's pretty common um, in, in people with MS. Um, with MS, it's usually unilateral. So one, one eye will be affected. Um, there are some other rare uh, inflammatory conditions. Uh, NMO is one of them. There can be a MOG-related disease, which is sort of out of the scope of the talk, but um, it can be bilateral in certain, certain instances. So, so we talked briefly last year about what, what MS is, but I just wanted to go over it again. So MS, really multiple sclerosis, literally refers to multiple scars. Um, we just like to use our, our old languages. Um, it's autoimmune, it's demyelinating, and it affects the central nervous system, right? So autoimmune just means that the immune system is attacking oneself, lots of different autoimmune conditions out there. Um, demyelinating means that the immune system is actually targeting primarily myelin and it can injure other structures, you know, axons and you name it, but it can cause nerve injury, but it's primarily targeting myelin, which is a coating surrounding nerve cells. Um, and it affects the central nervous system. So it really doesn't affect the periphery um, outside uh, of the central nervous system, just the brain and the spinal cord, really. Um, prevalence of MS is pretty high. So uh, we know that more than 2.5 million people are affected worldwide. Um, and it's probably more than that because close to 1 million people are affected in the US. So, it's, so we're, we're probably underestimating. Um, women uh, tend to outnumber men with a lot of autoimmune conditions. Um, that's the case. Um, and this tends to be a, a, a condition of the young. So uh, average disease onset is about 30 years plus or minus. So it's um, mostly between 15 to 45, although people can have MS at any age, um, can be diagnosed with MS at any age. Um, and it tends, it, it's actually one of the, one of the uh, uh, most common causes of disability in young adults. Um, it's a chronic disease, so it starts at, a, at an early age and it spans decades. A lot of the neurological conditions that we think about don't really affect people um, uh, or don't, don't cause neurological disability at a, at a younger age. Um, and it certainly affects quality of life, um, some minority, a substantial minority with severe disability and, and um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times it leads to unemployment or decreased employment, reduced hours, you name it. Um, and it's estimated that um, you know, altogether, um, an annual cost for somebody with MS is about seventy thousand um, dollars, and over over overall in the U.S., it's about twenty eight billion dollars per year. Um, the immunopathogenesis of MS is poorly understood, so we know that there are uh, immune cell uh, immune cells that cross uh, the blood brain barrier. Um, we don't really know exactly sort of what what stimulates this. Um, we think, you know, with every autoimmune condition, there's always a, a, a theory of what's called the molecular mimicry, um, which is where the immune system is, uh, you know, well, our immune systems attack all sorts of different antigens, foreign pathogens all the time. Um, and if one of those foreign pathogens may, may look similar to, to myelin, um, then maybe that you know, that, um, uh, that mimicry of myelin is what causes the immune system to then go after, 
go after um, uh, you know go after the central nervous system, but um, it's probably more complicated than that. Um, what we do know is that there's a, a mix of different types of T and B cells that that travel um, uh, and, and migrate into the into the central nervous system and can cause uh, demyelination, and that can lead to um, actual nerve cell loss as well. Um, and this is the this is the uh, these are the, the, the hallmarks of, of, uh, of MS. Again, multiple sclerosis, multiple scars. We talk about plaques or lesions, um, basically areas where uh, there was an, an overt inflammation um, uh, that, that can cause these, these scars uh, to occur. And so you see that here. Um, we thought back in the day that it really only affected the white matter of the, of the brain. You can see here in the corpus callosum, the connection between the two hemispheres that's heavily myelinated. Um, but we know that it can affect the cortex as well. So we do see that here and we do see that um, on special, uh, special MRI uh, imaging as well. So in our patient, um, so we're, we're gonna stop talking about our patient in a second, but um, she had optic neuritis. So if she were to get a brain MRI and we were to see lesions of the brain itself, um, that really suggests a very, very high likelihood of a second attack, um, basically is almost diagnostic of MS. And we, we do start to, start to, you know, we do try to treat these patients early. Um, conversely, the, the absence of any lesions in the brain and spinal cord really means that, means that maybe she'll be one of those uh, people with, you know, 50% of the time, optic neuritis doesn't really amount to very much. Sometimes it's a, it's a monophasic, what we refer to as a monophasic illness, it just happens once. We don't really know why, um, maybe a post-viral um, uh, response uh, as well, but we really, we really don't know when, when, when that happens. We sometimes don't know why it happens. Okay, so let's go over to another case, um, another illustrative case. So this is also a 30-year-old woman, also with no past medical history. Um, and she presented with uh, horizontal double vision for several days. So that just means that um, she was seeing two things sort of next to each other, overlapping next to each other. Um, and um, it's, she says that it's worse when looking into either direction, either horizontal direction. And when she closes one eye, double vision goes away. Her vision is okay. Um, so if she's looking with one eye or the other, um, that's okay. Um, but just both eyes together, um, uh, she has double vision. So what, uh, what <laughs> I put it here again, what, what should we do next? We'll, we'll, we'll examine her. Um, so this is, um, let me see if this will run. We're gonna do that again. Okay, so you already can see what, what this is. Um, let me see if I can. Oh. There we go. Okay, um, so you probably already saw that there <laughs> it sort of gave gave away the name in there, but um, but um, this is what we're seeing, and we sort of you know in this particular uh, person we saw it um, on both sides when she moved when when she moved her eyes to either direction. Um, but what we saw here, um, so at baseline, her eyes didn't really you know were um, more or less uh, you know coordinated. More or less. I mean, it was kind of um, you know maybe she had a little bit, a little bit of trouble um, at what we call primary gaze, which is just when when the eyes are looking straight ahead. Um, and in this particular uh, you know example, you know the looking to the looking to the right was okay. Again, in our patient, it was both sides. Um, but what you saw here when she was looking actually in our patient to either direction is that the the eye that was moving out was doing okay, okay? 
and the eye that was trying to move in was not really moving in very well. And you saw that both sides, so, so ignore this sort of middle one. Um, and this eye was sort of beating what we call nystagmus. It was sort of uh, beating in a funny way like this. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor move, but, um, but um, basically when she was trying to look in one direction, one eye was going okay, um, and then the other one wasn't really following. So what, 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 what happens here? I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the reason for this? Um, and so when we talk about eye movements um, and how we initiate eye movements, so first of all, um, this kind of, you know, movement of voluntary eye movements, right, comes from the frontal eye field. So that's in the cortex. And that sends signals over to the contralateral pons, so that's the um, uh, uh, PPRF in the pons, um, uh, and that, you know, sort of th then sends signals to the sixth, uh, the, the nucleus of the sixth uh, nerve, um, which controls, so everybody in medical school knows that the, that the sixth nerve controls the lateral rectus, which uh, moves the eye out, okay? Um, but in order to move the eye, in, in order to move, well, if you're moving one eye out, you want the eyes to stay coordinated. You want to move the other eye in with it. Okay. And so what happens is that this sort of, you can think of this as a complex of PPRF and the, and the sixth nucleus. Um, and what happens is it actually, if you're moving your, your, th this eye out, well, you want to send signals over to the other eye. Um, to the third nerve, and the third nerve actually moves this eye in, well, it moves, I mean, this third nerve would move this eye in also, but the third nerve, one of the functions is to move the eye in through the medial rectus. And so what happens is that this structure, this connection between right here, the pons, and then the third nucleus, the third nerve in the, in the midbrain is what's called the medial longitudinal fasciculus or MLF, okay? And that tends to be a very, very highly myelinated structure, okay? Um, and if that's injured, well, this eye can't move in very well, okay? And this eye is gonna try to do it, it's gonna start beating, okay? Um, and so this is what's called an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Ophthalmoplegia just means that the eyes are not moving very well. Um, ophthalmo eyes, plegia is weakness or, or paralysis. Um, and internuclear just refers to, well, you've got a nucleus here, you've got a nucleus here. It's the internuclear, right? It's between the two nuclei. Um, and so if we go back to look at this patient for a second, so you see her, her eye beating, but she's not moving the eyes inward very well. Okay. So then we can stop that here. Um, so this is this. So what what she had was a, was bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Again, as I mentioned, injury to the medial longitudinal fasciculus. It connects the abducens nucleus, which is six um, in the pons, to the oculomotor nucleus in the midbrain, which is three. Um, and so the result is unco uncoordinated eye movements, double vision, um, and the reason why well one eye is closed, she feels better because it's really, it's, it's double vision because the two eyes aren't moving very well together. But if you're, if you're removing that, um, you know, she can see very well from one eye, um, from each eye. Um, so it really disappears when the eyes are, when, when one eye is closed. Um, and it can be bilateral with midbrain, with, with sort of midline uh, brainstem uh, lesions. And um, so here you see an example um, it's very, very, very tiny, and it does. It has to, you know, it can just be a very, very tiny spot midline. Um, so this is a this is a midbrain lesion right here in the middle. Um, you can see it a little bit better on the on the sagittal view, but really, really right in the center. Um, and so if you hit the right spot right here to cause uh, bilateral um, injury, um, well, both eyes, um, when looking on either side, will be affected. So that gets the, the, you know, so as you can see with these two illustrative cases, the, the MS is a, so this person also um, uh, had MS. Um, this is also can be one of the um, presenting findings um, uh, in MS just because that structure again is very highly myelinated. 
Um, but it is a highly variable disease. So during an attack, during an episode of MS, well, there can be sudden vision loss in one eye. We talked about that with optic neuritis. Um, there can be su sudden weakness. So if somebody has spinal cord lesions or sudden numbness. Um, and then we talked about double vision, right? So brainstem involvement. Um, this is again an area where you can get uh, an INO, an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Trouble walking, dizziness can also occur with these sorts of things. And typically um, with an attack, things tend to get better. Um, and um, corticosteroids uh, typically tend to help. Outside of a relapse, so there are a lot of other conditions uh, outside of an attack that, that uh, there are other symptoms that uh, MS can also cause. And um, part, of the, part of the treatment is not only to, to sort of treat the acute uh, attacks to prevent acute attacks as well from occurring, but also to try to treat the symptoms that go along with MS. Um, so it's really, um, uh, th there, are, there are a few different sort of avenues of treatment um, that, we, that we target. Um, so let's do one, one last case, um, uh, another illustrative case. So this is a 50 year old woman um, who presents with uh, gradual worsening, uh, gradually worsening left leg weakness uh, over the past three years. And, you know, on physical exam, history taking, you name it, she says 10 years ago, she had an episode of blurry vision in one eye, lasted a week, it went away on its own. It was kind of mild, so she never really uh, enlisted a physician for this, um, just sort of went, went away and uh, never returned, so she didn't think much of it. Um, but now, then she developed this sort of gradual change in, 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 uh, in function. And so we do an MRI and we see lesions that are typical for MS. Um, and so this is an illustrative case because when we talk about MS, a lot of times we're talking about the relapsing or emitting kind, which is, um, uh, which is characterized by these sort of abrupt, uh, you know, acute onset um, of events, but a lot of times uh, doesn't have to be that way. And so MS can cause disability in two potentially overlapping ways. So sometimes people um, can have, you know, both at the same time. Um, so there can be sudden attacks, um, which is what we're talking about when we talk about optic neuritis, about internuclear ophthalmoplegia, um, new lesions that typically hit the, you know, hit, hit somewhere in the, in the central nervous system to cause these new symptoms. Um, or it can cause a gradual deterioration in level of function, which we refer to as progression or progressive MS. And we, um, so, so this is a sort of a schematic of, of what we mean by this. So relapsing or emitting these sort of acute bouts of, of you know, acute attacks um, with, uh, with, with, well, sometimes with remission back to normal, with improvement back to normal, that is, um, and sometimes with sort of a stepwise accrual of disability. So maybe they, maybe they, somebody doesn't regain everything that they had before, um, and then maybe has another attack, can have uh, more disability after that. So that's why we, we want to prevent relapses from occurring. Secondary progressive just means that they started out with relapses, with attacks, and then um, develop sort of this gradual uh, worsening and disability. And, and, you know, sometimes there can be superimposed relapses on top of that. So it's not, again, they're potentially overlapping. Primary progressive just means that they sort of started out without episodes, without abrupt um, uh, attacks, but sort of had a gradual change uh, in level of function. Um, so that gets us to the to the question of well, what drives this sort of uh, this gradual change? And we don't really know 100%. There are a lot of theories out there. Um, there is a theory that maybe early on there's there's uh, this overt inflammation, and then later stages um, or or what drives progression really is more of a degenerative process. Although um, there are um, <clears throat> different aspects of the immune system that have been implicated. Um, in, in progressive MS, so um, we really don't don't 100% know um, what drives progression. Um, as far as the diagnosis of MS, um, what we look for are characteristic lesions. Um, again, um, areas you know, lesions or scars in the central nervous system, and we look for dissemination in time and space. So, um, what that means, um, we'll get to in a second. Um, one of the things that is important before we sort of get to a diagnosis of MS is we want to think about other things that could mimic uh, MS. Um, and there are whole, there's a whole list of, of, of that sort of thing, as you can see. 
Um, but if you're, you know, people are, are careful and you go through it, um, a lot of these things, well, yeah, they can mimic MS, but typically they're not, you know, typically there's, there, there, there's sort of a, um, uh, something that clues you in, uh, to say that this is not, uh, that this is not the case. Um, so with regards to what I was talking about before dissemination space, dissemination time. So dissemination space really refers to the fact that MS affects multiple parts of the central nervous system. It's not just one little spot somewhere. It's multiple, right? Multiple scars, right? And so um, these are common places that we look for uh, as far as MS is concerned. So periventricular around these normal uh, cavities of the brain. So you can see that these, these white spots are really abutting the normal cavities of the brain. There's juxtacortical, so around the cortex, which is the outermost uh, layer of the brain. Um, you can see a, a pretty clear cut, um, uh, what we refer to as a curvy linear uh, juxtacortical lesion. Um, we look for lesions infratentorially, so in the posterior fossa. Um, so this is a good example of a uh, lesion of the brachium pontus, um, the um, middle cerebellar peduncle, um, and then the spinal cord. That's the other place that we look for, we look for lesions. Um, the dissemination time really refers to the fact that, well, MS is a chronic condition, it's a long-term condition. We don't want to diagnose MS when somebody has a monophasic illness, right? Remember, that's, there's that word again. So when somebody has just a one-time thing, well, we don't want to put them on uh, medication to, you know, preventative medication if they don't have to be, right? And so it's really important to, to get that information that, listen, this, this, this has been changing over time. There's some, you know, there's evidence of, of um, chronicity here. And so sometimes what we see on MRI is, is evidence of, well, contrast enhancing lesions and non-enhancing lesions. So uh, non-enhancing lesions, so enhancing meaning uh, recent, meaning acute uh, lesions. So we sometimes see that sort of uh, on one MRI, we see, well, a mix of old lesions, a mix of new lesions. Um, or we watch the MRIs over time. Maybe there, maybe there are new lesions that develop. Or sometimes, um, you know, people have have a second clinical attack, or maybe we hear of that in the in the, in the history. Um, and sometimes we do um, uh, look at the at the spinal fluid as well for what's called the oligoclonal bands, which are present in the majority of people with MS. It's not quite everybody, so um, so we don't always uh, go to you know jump to CS to, to cerebrospinal fluid, but we uh, we sometimes when it's sort of unclear, we we, we sometimes do that. Um, the discussion of sort of, you know, disease modifying treatments or preventative treatments for, for MS um, is um, uh, kind of out of the scope of the talk, but, um, but basically, um, just briefly, there are uh, over 20 preventative uh, treatments for MS in 10 different classes, um, just to give you an idea of how um, different it is from, from the you know, relatively from the recent past, um, the first treatment was only approved in 1993. So um, prior to that, there was really nothing. And prior to 2010, um, only injections and, and one infusion uh, uh, were available. And so um, it really has ballooned the last, uh, the last decade. Um, and as far as treatment for progressive MS, there's really, um, that's been only the past, uh, the past several years. Um, and there are a lot of different, you know, as I mentioned, there are 10 different classes, so they each have, you know, slightly different um, mechanism of actions, or me mechanisms of action, rather. Um, sh you know, some can, can shift sort of the immune system from a uh, pro-inflammatory to a more regulatory profile. Um, some act in, in sort of decreasing the permeability of the blood-brain barrier or mimicking myelin. Um, to sort of act as we think a, a competitive inhibitor to myelin. Um, uh, some act in, at, on sequestering lymphocytes in, in the lymph nodes. Um, other, others uh, can act on prevention of, of these immune cells into the central nervous system. Um, and some of them act by, by depleting um, immune cells. So it really has uh, led to the to the transformation of MS, typically um, or often in a, a you know a, has transformed it into a, ma a manageable condition, um, and this is just the list of medications that we have available uh, nowadays. So um, we reviewed a lot here. 
Um, just, to, just to recap, we reviewed uh, sort of a couple of common acute first presentations for MS, um, optic neuritis and inter, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Um, we also reviewed sort of the, the difference between um, uh, progressive and, and relapsing or remitting MS. We reviewed the epidemiology, the pathophysiology, um, and again, the, the subtypes of, of MS. Um, and just to recap, um, this, is, uh, this is sort of a, a peek into uh, what neuroimmunology is all about. Um, I did wanna sort of um, uh, give you a little bit of sort of bread and butter neurology and talk about, uh, talk about anatomy because um, because when, we, when it gets to these cases, it really does, it really is illustrative um, uh, what we can, you know, we can read the book and then, and then go to clinical practice and actually see the things that we read about. That's, that's always, um, it's always useful to, to solidify things. So, um, but anyway, thank you for, um, for allowing me to give this, uh, this presentation. And if you have any, um, any questions, educational resources up here, I'm sure, um, I'm sure you'll get a copy of this, um, uh, of this, uh, of, of this presentation. So. Thank you, Dr. Harrell. Um, that was super informative. I'm always so impressed with neurology. I feel like with like the differential diagnosis, knowing the anatomy so well, it's like very, very impressive. Um, but since we were talking about MS and I saw that that is a focus of your research, um, using advanced MRI techniques to monitor disease worsening. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more um, and talk about what you're doing there. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I um, you know, one, one of my interests is, is in um, sort of pushing the field with regards to uh, imaging. Um, a lot of, lot of different research interests that, that, that I'm in, you know, a lot of different projects that I've got my, my hands into these days, but, um, but one thing that um, I, you know, one thing that I, I really do find interesting, and it's it's out of the, it's out a little bit of outside the scope of the, of of this talk. But basically, you know, we have these um, lesions that are, you know, these scars that are hall, you know, that are basically the hallmark of MS, right? That's what that's why we refer to it as MS. What we do know is that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff that happens um, underneath the surface that we can't really, you know, that we don't really detect with routine. Um, MRI techniques um, that we don't uh, detect with our clinical exams and that um, can occur without sort of overt um, new symptoms from occurring. So it can, it can be sort of silent. And then, um, you know, the question in the field is, could this um, sort of um, almost this sort of subtle um, indolent um, injury, could that build up over time? And, you know, if it starts in somebody's, uh, you know, when, when somebody's 20, well, can that affect somebody uh, when, when they're, when they're, when they're 60, when they're 80, and can that, um, can that take a toll? And is that what is um, sort of driving what we refer to as progression, right? Again, we don't, we don't really know what underlies uh, progression. We, um, you know, so it's, that remains a, a, a big question in the field. Now, one, one thing that we can do um, with regards to, to advanced MRI techniques, so one thing that we can do is we can image, you can use different techniques to actually image um, the integrity of, of the white matter. Um, and one project that I've uh, been involved with is, well, what happens when we when we look at people who are um, deemed stable, right? So over the years, we say, okay, well, no no new lesions on the MRI. Um, they're they're doing okay as far as we can tell. Um, so no disability worsening, and uh, they haven't had any relapses. So this is what we refer to as NIDA three or, or no evidence of disease activity. Um, it's a short term sort of metric that you know. Uh, uh, a short-term um, uh, sort of um, benchmark that, that, that we use, what's called NIDA-3. Um, and, um, and we don't, um, you know, so, so we don't know what, whether, that's, whether that's good enough um, to really monitor, uh, monitor people. And so um, some studies have looked at um, uh, brain atrophy rates in people who meet NIDA-3 versus do not meet NIDA-3. And it does seem that even, even if somebody is quote unquote stable, they may have changes in uh, brain volume that is not 
um, quite normal. It's not, it's not, you know, it's a little bit um, uh, more pronounced than in the general population. And so what I was interested in looking at is, okay, well, brain volumes are changing. Well, could the white matter be changing? And what we did show is that it did seem to, it did seem to change despite um, being on medication, despite um, having no new lesions, having no new attacks, no overt symptoms. Um, well, it did seem to change. It changed less than people who were not stable, um, but, uh, but, but there was some white matter deterioration. So the question is, again, what is driving that? Um, and, um, and, and, how, and how do we treat it? How do we change it? Um, but right now, um, we don't know whether, okay, well, do we switch from this medication to that medication? Does that make, a, you know, does that change things? Um, we just, we, we don't know the answer to that. So it's, it's really, um, you know, we can, our, as far as imaging techniques have come a long way, we have a lot of different imaging techniques out there. Obviously it's, it's, um, it's tricky to, to perform that type of research because you, you know, you, um, you know, especially longitudinal research, um, uh, you know, you want to make sure that people are coming back for, for MRIs and that sort of thing. But, um, but um, we have a lot that we can do in the, in the, uh, from the imaging perspective in the research world, but we don't know how that actually relates to the clinical. Um, and then my big question is, okay, well, we have this information in the clinic. Um, what do we do about that? You know, um, and, um, and, and the, as of right now, there's no data on the subject. So um, anyway, that's just, that's just one, um, one example of, of, of something that we've done. Thank you for sharing that with us. I, I see like that in order to figure out how to treat a problem, you need to kind of understand more about what that problem is and how it presents like through imaging um, before you can like actually figure out the best course of treatment. Um, and I'm sure it's also helpful to like to have better imaging in terms of like the differential diagnosis and better understanding, like to make sure that person does have like what you think they have. Um, Amelia just asked, is stem cell therapy for MS promising? Have you heard anything about that? Um, yeah, so uh, stem cell therapy, I mean, uh, the main one that's out there right now um, is um, hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant. Um, the, so what, what, what I can say about that is, is it is, um, I think that it's, it's, I mean, I think we have enough um, small studies to say that it is beneficial for people um, that are having relapses over and over again um, and sort of failing, failing medication. Um, that is much, much, much less common these days. Um, so as far as what we mean by relapses attacks, um, what I mean by that is, okay, there's a, there, there's a new lesion it hits the wrong spot to cause a new symptom, right? Um, because it all depends on where it hits in the, in the nervous system. So if it hits the wrong spot or it's, it's, um, it's disruptive enough to cause an attack, um, that's what I mean by an attack or, or, or a relapse. And so um, most of the time we can control, we can actually, we've come a long way over the last 10 years, we can actually prevent um, relapses in, in a lot of people. Um, and so it's become extreme, you know, much, much, much less common to see somebody going from one medication to another, to another, and not having control of relapses. Um, and, um, and it's important to, to, to make that distinction between progression because, um, you know, stem cell transplant, that stem cell therapy is not, uh, proven for, for progressive MS. Um, and, um, those, you know, there are a couple of studies that are out there. Um, one that is looking at um, uh, hematopoietic stem cell therapy um, uh, transplant um, compared to maximal medical therapy. Um, another one is, uh, and one is looking at it and relapsing. One is looking at it progressive. So, um, so these studies are being done, but it it seems to be you know, very good at preventing relapses um, in people that have, have severe relapses over and over again. Again, not very common. Progressive MS, it doesn't really seem to be effective for, and that's where we have sort of a, a, an unmet need in, in clinical practice. And so, um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it'll become the, 
um, the sort of the, the dominant type of treatment out there, um, just because there are um, substantial risks at the beginning, at first. Um, and if we can do better with, with, um, with uh, or do as well with, with medications that maybe aren't as risky, um, you know, that, that, that may be good enough. And that's, that's the way it is at the moment. We'll see, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the data looks like. Thank you. Uh, I think that was helpful um, and definitely answered her question. Um, someone's asking, uh, actually, two people have asked what kind of infusions are used for MS? So um, there are a couple. Um, so, so MS uh, treatments, there's, uh, you know, there are injectable medications that people um, inject themselves with. Usually they're able to do it on their own. Um, nowadays, everything is sort of, you know, has, its, you know, has like an auto injector. So it's not, you know, they don't have to deal with needles too much. Um, so there are those. Um, there are oral medications, pills. Oh, give me one second. Apologies. Um, so those are pills. Um, uh, and, um, and then as far as infusions, so the, the common ones out there, so there's, um, uh, the oldest one is called natalizumab. Um, that's a once, once every month, um, infusion and, um, and ocrelizumab is out there as well. Somebody, somebody mentioned that in the chat, um, uh, alemtuzumab as well. So there, there are, there, there are a few. Um, and there will be even more in the, in the, in the pipeline. Got it. Um, I think I'm looking at the time. Um, we have like a couple minutes left to kind of step back from talking about like MS. Um, I think that people would love to know more about like you and why you chose neurology. What about the field appealed to you then? Like, <laughs> what do you love about it now? Just stuff like that. And like yeah. advice about how to even pursue that track as well. Sure, sure. So yeah, so I I, I think um, I um I I think I I went you know I, I think everybody goes into medicine and their own spot specialty for a mix of two reasons. One is um, one is um, uh, you know is is the is is in order to to be able to help people. Um, and then the other one is, um, well, what, what drives you, what interests you, right? Um, and I think neurology for me, I mean, it's, it's um, I always looked at neurology and as, as uh, uh, you know, especially almost in its infancy. I mean, we're, we're you know, when I, when I was in residency, I mean, we were sort of, uh, you know, people were toying with, um, uh, you know, with, um, uh, you know, uh, intravascular, um, uh, you know, clot retrieval and whatnot for, for stroke. People are sort of, you know, the, the trials were out there, but but not only it, it took until sort of the end of my residency until we finally got information that said, well, these these um, these interventions are are really um, are really um, uh, profoundly helpful, um, and so. Um, uh, you know, and, and so the, the, the field has, you know, is, con is continuing to move um, and it's relatively, um, again, relatively uh, in its infancy. And I think it will, um, that's not to say it hasn't moved, but it will move even, uh, even more dramatically over the next 10, 20 years. And I, I, I like to be part of that. Um, so I think um, so. I think that that interested me. This sort of um, the the uh, potential for progress, um, uh, both from a, a research point of view, but also I always like the idea of okay, well, we can do something in the clinic to help people. But we, you know, there's a lot that we know and a lot that we don't know, um, and a lot that we that we need to push on. Um, and I like that interplay. Um, so that's why I got into neurology, and I think you know, neuroimmunology, MS, that sort of thing. I mean, I think we can do a lot for these people. Um, so we can really, um, you know, and you see that day to day that, you know, some people, if they were diagnosed with MS 20 or 30 years ago, um, it would have been life-changing and now not so much. Um, 
you know, obviously, I mean, there, you know, there's still a lot, uh, you know, a lot, uh, a lot of progress that's still needed. Um, there's no question about that. But, um, but a lot of times we can really intervene and, and, and really make a make a big change. So I, I like that. Um, uh, so, so that's why I got into into neuroimmunology. Um, and so it's not only, um, you know, not only uh, am I sort of, uh, obviously I'm interested in immunology, um, I was thinking about infectious disease back in the day, um, and I'm interested in neurology, but there's also, of course, the, the, the aspect of, of trying to um, uh, do better for our, for, for, for our patients, um, both in the clinic and research. Yeah, I think uh, the interdisciplinary approaches in medicine are some of like the coolest, like not just immunology, not just neurology, but bringing them together. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think, um, I mean, talk about inter, inter, interdisciplinary care. I mean, you know, people with um, chronic neurological conditions, I mean, we, you know, they need other specialists as well, not just neurologists. And, and we, um, you know, um, we really uh, spend a lot of time coordinating, uh, coordinating together. From a neurologist once that it is like, neurology is part of this big team. Um, like there's rehabilitation therapists, stuff like that too. Can you speak to that a little bit more about like who you work closely with um, other than like other neurologists? Yeah, um, yeah, so I, I work, um, so we have, um, of course, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses. Um, outside of that, and other, you know, and other specialties. Um, uh, well, ophthalmologists are very important, as you can tell from my talk. Um, I think uh, you know, urologists are, are of course important because a lot of people with neurological symptoms, uh, neurological diseases, especially um, central nervous system diseases, they can they can have neurological uh, urological problems. Um, physical therapists, physiatrists, um, absolutely are are essential. Um, so um, uh, that's just a just just to name a few. I mean, psychologists. Um, a lot of people with uh, neurological illnesses, especially MS, can have um, psychological uh, symptoms. Uh, so, so, so that's it's very, very important to have good mental health, um, uh, either with psychology or with, um, or, or, or if need be, psychiatry. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Harrell. I want to be conscious of your time. It's almost eleven. Um, and we do have Dr. Waldenberg speaking next, more about like medical school admissions and stuff like that. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us and like giving us insight into what neurology is like. Um, I know everyone's really, really grateful uh, to just be able to learn from you and even work through a case study it was really fascinating. Um, it just goes to show you like how much goes into this like one diagnosis. It's really quite fascinating. Um, yeah so thank you well thank you for having me thanks to everybody um and um yeah enjoy the rest enjoy the rest of the day thank you so much have a good rest of your day too dr